Bruchem Aboyim, thank you very much for coming. Uh, again, welcome to our home once again. <clears throat> and uh, again, the lecture today will be on a topic called Fail to Succeed. And again, with the pandemic, again, everybody, many people are on a, feeling a low uh, sense of failure, sense of loss. And I thought it'd be a good topic to discuss. So, fail to succeed. Do you really need to fail in order to succeed? Not always. But many times, those things that seem to be the worst events in our lives, in time, actually prove to be the door to our greatest achievements and bring about the most success. For example, in 1940, there was a cartoonist by the name of Walter Lance. He married an actress, uh, Grace Stafford. And instead of the traditional honeymoon, where they may have gone to uh, taken a room in a five-star hotel, they decided to rent a cabin in the woods that was on a lake, very rustic, private, and what they thought would be a very romantic honeymoon. So they rented the cabin for three days, and one would call it, in the end, anything but romantic. It seemed that on the very first night in their cabin, after an exhausting day, as they were about to go to sleep, they started to hear some constant pecking on the roof. It was a woodpecker. And it was busy at work, pecking at the roof of their cabin. At first they laughed <clears throat> and thought that it was kind of rustic, interesting. But the problem was the woodpecker kept it up most of the night. So they got up the next morning and tired, but they went about their day with really little thought of the night before. And the second night after another exhausting day, <laughs> the same scenario repeated itself. The woodpecker was hard at work and they again got very little sleep. By the third and last night, they were totally exhausted. Now they really hoped that the woodpecker was finally gone, but no such luck. The pecking just continued and to add insult to injury, <laughs> naturally started to rain. And the woodpecker had pecked a hole above their bed and the rain was dripping down on them all night. So the next morning, <clears throat> they packed up all their belongings into the car, and they began the ride back home. You know, Grace turns to Walter, and she said, you know, that honeymoon was great. And he looked at her with a smile, and he nodded his head. And then she said to him, problem is now we just have to figure out how. And they both laughed. Shortly afterwards, they created the very popular and successful cartoon character, Woody Woodpecker. Their honeymoon, which was terrorized by the constant pecking of the bird, and then being even drenched by the hole in the roof that the bird had made, became that which supported them in luxury for the rest of their lives. The failure of their honeymoon <clears throat> became the major success in their lives. You know, if we look into the Torah and examine the life of Yosef, one can only imagine what it would have been like at the age of 17 to be torn away from a wealthy and loving home and then sold into slavery, to be all alone in a strange land with even a different language. Really, things couldn't get much worse, but they did. There's an old saying. They told me to cheer up, things could get worse, and I cheered up, and sure enough, things got worse. The um, Yosef is accused now of a crime that he didn't complain, that he didn't commit. He is thrown into a dungeon. Now he's really reached rock bottom. He had no money, no family, no friends, no influence. He had nothing. But amazingly, he had a great deal. He had never lost his connection, his belief in God Almighty. He definitely was knocked down, but he never was knocked out. In the worst of situations, he was always Yosef. He somehow was able to dictate to the situation and not have the situation dictate to him. He always demonstrated what we a work ethic and a positive perspective. He used his challenges as a ladder to help him climb out of the pit and to reach the highest levels of heaven and earth. You know, Yosef is referred to as many of the terms our forefathers we called um, Abraham Avino, our father, Moshe, the teacher, <clears throat> Aaron, the priest. Yosef is referred to as Yosef Atzadik, Joseph, the righteous one. This was not an accident. In the book of Proverbs, in uh, Mishlei, written by King Solomon, 24.16, it states, 
Kisheva Yipol Tzadik Vakom, that a righteous individual falls seven times, but he gets up. Perseverance. Yosef showed why he deserved to be called a tzaddik. But why seven times? This alludes to those who put their faith in the seven planets, the astrological forces. Yosef's faith was only in God Almighty. Not that any other so-called, of those any so-called powers of astrology. Now it's interesting that seven also alludes to the daily challenges of life, the seven days of the week. But in the end, Yosef showed that he was able to merit the come, the eight, the eternity in the world and, and reward in the world of his eternity of Olam Haba. You know, failure is not the worst scenario. Complacency and lack of effort is. If there is action, even if it's incorrect, there is something you can correct. <clears throat> we are told by our sages that if one does an improper action against God, if he sins and his Torah, it can be corrected. One can do tshuva, one can repent. But it, not just that, it's a, that you can repent, but the sin can be absolved. One can actually turn the sin into a mitzvah. There's a medrash that states that Yaakov was destined to come down to Egypt in chains. But God, in his ultimate mercy, allowed Yaakov to come down with great honor and respect. Not only was Yosef able to support his whole family during the famine, that was devastating the world, but he had the honor and the privilege to repay his father with 17 of the best years of his life. We see a similar scenario in the life of Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, our teacher. <clears throat> the ups and downs in life that he had, torn away from his family shortly after he was born, then cast into an uncertain future. But then he's brought into luxury, a prince in the house of Pharaoh. But then again, things take a turn for the worst. Two Jews accuse him of killing an Egyptian. Pharaoh tries to have him executed, and he is forced to escape. Now he's running for his life. He's a fugitive and a man on the run. We meet him many years later as at a water hole, where he interacts with Yisro's daughters. He seems to have found some peace with Yisro. He marries his daughter and starts a family. But then God calls out to Moshe for the true mission of his life, to take the children of Israel out of Egypt. But the really <clears throat> question becomes, if God wanted Moshe to take the Jews out of Egypt, why make him leave in the first place? I think this is best illustrated by a story found in the Talmud in Gemara and Shabbos 33b. A story of three sages, Rabbi Yehuda, Rabbi Shimon, and Rabbi Yossi, who were in the bathhouse during the time of the occupation after the destruction of the temple with the Romans. And Rabbi Huda was praising the, the Romans for the bathhouse they were in, for the roads, for the water, for all of the improvements that he saw that the Romans brought with them. Rabbi Yossi was silent, and Rabbi Huda, pardon me, Rabbi, Rabbi Shimon, <clears throat> said, why praise them? They did it for themselves. They didn't do it for us. There was another individual in the bathhouse, and he went and told the Romans. And the Romans heard Rabbi Shimon had a run for his life for, for not showing proper respect for the Romans. He was in the cave with his son for 13 years. Rabbi Yehuda was made the head of the academy, the head rabbi of the time. And Rabbi Yossi was exiled to a city. Why to a city? Because a man has no power in a place where he grew up. Grow up. People always see you as the child you were no matter what you do as an adult. So we see all the events that occurred in Moshe's life were all interconnected in one unbroken chain. Everything, everything was God's design. Nothing was an accident. It was necessary for him to see the Jews in a negative light. After all, they had informed on him. He had to run for his life. The reason, this way he would stay away and not try to help his people. He thought he knew the reason why they deserved their plight. It was also necessary for him to be separated from his family and to be brought up in the palace of Paro. After all, in the future, when he would stand before Paro, he wouldn't be in a state of awe. This was the place, the palace, where he played when he was a child. He was very comfortable. There was a measure that says that he was also the king of Ethiopia for 40 years, learning the art of kingship. God was grooming him all of his life. God gave him the credentials 
that he would need, the ups and downs, so that he would be able to fulfill his mission, to be a true leader. All the rabbis are elevated by their position, and that's why they are called rabbi, rabbi so-and-so, their title and then their name. Moshe is the exception. We call him Moshe Rabbeinu. First his name and then his title. It was his name that elevated the position. As an aside, I found it interesting to note that God commanded us to keep what we call Tariyag Mitzvah, 613 commandments. The numerical value of the word Torah is 611. Why not 6? Why, not, why only 611? Why not 613? So when the Jewish nation stood at the foot of Mount Sinai, they heard the first two commandments of the Torah directly from God. The other 611 were transmitted to them through Moshe Rabbeinu, Moshe our teacher. And the verse in the book of Devarim in the last portion of the Torah 34.4 states, Torah Tzivolonu Moshe, that Moshe taught us the Torah. That alludes to all 613 commandments. And so the numerical value of the name of the words Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, our teacher, is 613, since it was he who taught us all 613 commandments. So the question becomes, how are we to understand success in this world? What is success and who determines what it really is? In reality, success is God's. What we have is effort. We may not achieve the goal that we wanted, but that's really God's business. However, we own the effort. The effort is ours. As it states in Pirkei Avot, The Ethics of the Fathers, 521, then Bagbag said, Lufam Sara Agra, commensurate with the effort is the reward. We are guaranteed that we will always be rewarded by God Almighty for our efforts, whether we fail or succeed. However, we should, well, should we fail in our efforts, that we should be comforted by the knowledge that failure brings with it its own reward. Good judgment comes from experience. And experience comes from bad judgment. You learn very little from success, but you learn a whole lot from failure. You know, many of us fail because we just don't put enough effort in. Some of us fail because our goals are set too high, they're really not realistic. We set ourselves up for failure. Others fail because they don't have the discipline to stay the course. Others because of a lack of preparation. Success comes more easily to some than it does to others. However, the degree of satisfaction often differs from one person to another. One step taken by a little baby can bring much joy and satisfaction, much more than the miles run by an adult. Almost all the stories in the Torah about people that never gave up. If one well was plugged up, they dug another and another. Even with the relationship with God Almighty, they pushed the envelope. Failure was not an option. There were bigger successes and smaller successes. Failure was only an opportunity to bend down so that they could jump up even higher. Now, we do see stories in the Torah where people gave up and the results were negative. Noah gave up on his generation and they all perished. The Jews in the desert cried in their tents, afraid of entering the land. They gave up. They wanted to stay in the desert. They were granted their wish. They wandered in the desert for 40 years, and there they died. Even though both of these events were failures, negative, look at the results. With the flood came the rainbow, a promise to never destroy the world again. It was the birth of a new and better world, a world in which an Abraham Avino and Abraham lived, a world that would be given the Torah, a book of instruction, to guide them on their path through the minefield that we call life. Can you, can you imagine what the na Jewish nation would have looked like without the 40 years in the desert? Each and every day they witnessed God's miracles, the falling of the mun, the godly food from heaven, the well of Miriam, a sea of water, and they were surrounded on six sides with the clouds of glory. They were taught by the ultimate teachers, Moshe and Aaron. They were not only able to study the Torah, they had time and tranquility to live it, to internalize it. There's a reason why we are called the people of the book. If they would have followed the original itinerary, they would have entered the land in a little more than a year. 
they have entered as separate tribe nations, farmers, with little or no knowledge of God or his Torah. We would have been lost like so many other nations who had their moment in history and are now gone. Now, as long as one has a strong foundation, you can build anything you want, and it will survive. The world's foundation was formed after the flood, and the foundation of the Jewish nation was forged during the 40-year period they wandered in the desert. They entered Egypt not equal. There were eight brothers. There were eight brothers from the primary wives, Rachel and was a power failure um, and uh, hopefully we'll connect the two together it says that uh, as long as one has a strong foundation you can build anything you want and it will survive the world's foundation was formed after the flood and the foundation of the Jewish nation was formed after the 40 year period of them wandering in the desert they entered the land of Egypt as 12 brothers but they really were not equal there were eight brothers from the primary wives, Rachel and Leah, and the other four brothers were from the secondary wives, Billa and Zilpa, the concubines, and they had a much lesser status. However, when they emerged from the melting pot of Egypt, they had coalesced into one unified body, the children of Israel. This was what God wanted. One nation, one God, one Torah. I'd like to finish off with a story I think demonstrates this concept that many times our greatest successes come through failures. Many times when we hit rock bottom, when it just can't get any worse. You know, Henry Ford went bankrupt five times, as did Milton Hershey of Hershey's Chocolate. The same was true of Walt Disney. For some people, failure is a wall, and for others, it's a door. They tell the story of a great rabbi, Rav Hai Gond, who was not only a great scholar, but he was also very wealthy. And as was customary, uh, people would buy new dishes, not like today when we can throw things out, um, for the holiday of Passover, Pesach. And he sent his uh, servant with a new set of expensive dishes down to the river to put them in the water, a ritual, I think, of putting them in a mikvah, of, of dunking them. And the servant took the dishes all down to the river. And as he, as he was starting to get ready to dunk the dishes into the water one by one, a large wave came and swept all the dishes into the river. None were left. And he was beside himself. He didn't know what to do and what to say. <clears throat> so he decided that the master had many dishes and the odds are that rather than upset the master maybe cause grief for himself the best thing to do is be quiet don't say anything and that's what he did he didn't mention it to anybody and as he suspected it went undetected well the next year again he was told again to take dishes down to the river but this time he was more careful and as he was about to start dipping dunking the dishes into the river to his amazement, he looked and he saw that in the river were all the dishes from last year and they were being brought. It kind of floated to him. <clears throat> when everything was said and done, he had every dish from the day, year before. Pristine. Nothing was even broken. Nothing scratched. And he was so excited, he ran back to the mansion of his master. Rabbi Gong was studying in his, in his, off, in his library. And the servant came in with great excitement. And he said, Master, Master, you won't believe it. And he told him the whole story how he had lost all the dishes the year before. And now this year, they all came back. And he said, Master, Master, see how much God loves you. He's even returned your dishes to you. And somehow, Rabbi Haigon didn't crack a smile, didn't seem happy. If anything, he seemed very concerned. And the servant thought that the Rabbi Haigon was angry at him. So... He sheepishly made his exit. From that day on, Rabbi Gon's fortunes turned south. And in a relatively short time, he became a pauper. And he had to go from town to town just to make ends meet, to eat. His servant, on the other hand, went to Egypt 
And there he became a wealthy entrepreneur. And his fortunes were very, very large. Just so happened that this servant was in the marketplace one day and he looks up and who does he see? His beloved master, Rabbi Gon, totally drawn, emaciated. He looked very, very ill, very weak. And the servant ran up to him and said, Master, Master, and he hugged him, kissed him. And he said, please come with me, you'll stay with me. And he took Rabbi Gon back to his mansion now and took him into his own room and put him in his own bed. And he himself nursed Rabbi Gon day after day. He had only the best doctors come to examine him and try to bring him back to his good health. But he seemed to get worse and worse. And finally, he went to a specialist and he says, there, there has to be something I can do. And the specialist said, there is one thing. If you can go to the marketplace and buy three fat chickens, put them in a pot and cook them for hours and hours until you're left with just one spoon of essence. If you can get him to drink, to swallow that spoon of essence, there's a small chance he might be able to recover. He needs the strength. He needs the nutrition. And so the servant quickly ran out, bought three chickens, cooked them. The whole house smelled from chicken. <clears throat> and when it had melted down to the one spoon, he very carefully, gingerly brought the spoon of essence into the room where Reb Haigon lay, more dead than alive. And he lifted Reb Haigon's head and he took the spoon and he was, he was bringing it to his mouth. All of a sudden, a spider web descended from the ceiling. And just before he put the spoon into Reb Haigon's mouth, the spider web landed right on the spoon, making it inedible. And tears started to come down the face of the servant. And to his amazement, when he looked at Rabbi Gon, he was smiling, smiling. He couldn't understand it. And finally, he said to Rabbi Gon, Rabbi, I have to ask you a question. When I brought you, when I brought you the um, dishes from the year before, the, I thought you'd be thrilled. Instead, instead you were troubled I, I didn't understand and now when the worst thing that could possibly happen has happened I thought you'd be devastated instead you're smiling why would you be smiling and why were you devastated then and Rabbi Gon said to his servant he said to his servant you see when you told me about the dishes it was so unreal so over the top I realized that I had hit the top of my pyramid. And then from then on, the only place I could go was down. But now, when you've gone through all this trouble to make this one spoon of essence, and a spider web falls on it, there's really nothing worse than that. Which means, I've hit the bottom. And if I've hit the bottom, and I'm still here, I'll be able to move up from here. And with that, Rabbi Gon was able to have a complete recovery and continue to live. Now, the good news about hitting bottom is that you only have one way to go, up. And we all use this time in our lives to grow and somehow turn this negative into a positive. And with that, may we merit to herald in the coming of Mashiach Sikainu quickly and in our time. Thank you very much for listening. I hope this all came together uh, one way or another. And um, what I'd like to do now is continue...